What is up, fight fans? Man, we are pumped. It's MMA Weekly. I'm Jim Greasehopper. Call me Grease along with my buddy Jeff Kane, and we are here right now to bring you MMA Weekly's UFC Fight Night Preview. Blades versus Lewis at the Apex, the heavyweights, number two and number four, throwing down this weekend. And, of course, it is powered by CBD Emporium featuring Level Select CBD. Man, I'm going to tell you what right now. I'm 49. I feel better than ever. I drank too much coffee, admittedly, but I have more energy than I've had in years. A lot of it's because I love what I'm doing. The rest is because of Level Select CBD from CBD Emporium. I'm talking about roll-ons. I'm talking about creams to get rid of the pain. Tinctures under your tongue with a little dropper. You can be fancy. Give yourself that little stress relief, sleep better, pain-free life. It is unbelievable, guys, and you're going to get 50% off right now. That's right, you. 50% off right now with the code MMA50 by going to stayinthefightmma.com. Stayinthefightmma.com for 50% off with the code MMA50. CBD Emporium featuring Level Select CBD. Stay in the fight. And what a fight we have this weekend, and, and neither one of these guys has the opportunity to stay in a fight all that long if the other one connects early, Jeff Kane. Blades versus Lewis, number two and number four. The big boys getting ready to rumble in Vegas this weekend. Oh, yeah, big, big main event with two big guys. Uh, like you said, ranked uh, two and four, correct? Uh, then, yeah, this is a huge fight in the heavyweight division, and this is kind of leads up to next week's fight, a headlining fight in the heavyweight division, which all culminates at the end of March with the heavyweight title fight on the line. Yeah, no doubt. And what a, what a five- or six-week period. My math isn't all that great. For the heavyweight division, when you're talking about Stipe versus Ganu in the end of March, but getting us there right now, two and four, Blades and Lewis, Blades two, Lewis four, both of them elite heavyweights, Blades looking to leap into title contention. Lewis has been there in the past and fought for a strap against Daniel Cormier. He's fought the best in the world, maybe a little edge there in terms of quality of opponent compared to Blades, but also Jeff Rosenstreich and Gon is coming up in just a couple of weeks, and that is a huge, so that's three versus seven. And, of course, you had Volkov just beat Overeem. That was two weeks ago. So everything playing itself out in the heavyweight division with John Jones' impending entrance into that division as well. So you have a lot going on at heavyweight, but we're going to get a ton of answers starting this weekend. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this this fight card features not only does the whole month and, and has and, and and leads all the way up to that in end of March uh, pay per view event. This fight card has it, half of the main card is heavyweight bouts. You know, so we're we're featuring a lot of heavyweights on this, um, and, and and they did that for a reason. <laughs> you know, well, we also have uh, another heavyweight bout uh, later or earlier or sorry earlier in the fight card between Alexi Olenek and. Uh, that, that, that should be a good one, too, man. You know, that those are ranked guys. Um, the heavyweight division title picture is going to come pretty clear, but like you just mentioned, John Jones is, is going to jump in there and screw all these rankings up anyway. Yeah, I mean, he is because he's going to get the winner of Stipe and Nganu, and deservedly so. You've said it on the show multiple times. He's the GOAT. He walks in and gets the title shot, and Blades doesn't like it. Curtis Blades, you know, had some comments to say about that. He'll be sitting back there rolling his eyes and so forth, but I will say this. Curtis Blades better be careful thinking too much about anything or anyone other than the black beast Derek Lewis right now. When you're talking about Derek Lewis, look, he fought DC for the title. He's won three in a row over Ivanov, Latifi, who came up to heavyweight, and Alexi Olenek, who you just mentioned, who fights Chris Dawkins this weekend. But that's coming off of two straight losses. He fought DC for the belt, and then he got knocked out, TKO'd by Junior Dos Santos. He's fought Hunt. He's fought Tabura. He's fought Travis Brown. He's fought Volkov and beaten Volkov. He has a win over Francis Ngannou. He is the top of the tops in the heavyweight division. And for Blades, who's looking to make that leap, did not impress people with his last couple of performances, especially against Alexander Volkov. He's got to win, but he's got to win convincingly to inject himself into that picture to even be worried about John Jones. Yeah, I mean, this is a big fight. I, I don't know that he has to win convincingly, although I think whoever wins this fight, it's going to be a convincing win, right? I don't see this going the distance. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you're going to, both of these guys have comparable records. It's the Ngannou win for Lewis that puts him ahead of Blades uh, as far as uh, uh, quality of opponents go, but yeah. Blades is ranked higher. Francis beat Blades twice, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's his only loss. Blades' only loss is to Francis Ngannou. And so, you know, he has wins over the number five, number six, number eight, number 10, and number 12 ranked guys. Uh, you know, his record speaks for itself. But the Black Beast, man, he touches you, it's over. And, and what I was saying about Derek Lewis is his win over Ngannou, in my opinion, makes his record a little better than Blades, even though Blades is technically ranked two positions higher. 
Yeah, and when you think about that, man, I think about this division, and anyone can get their lights turned out at any time. And, you know, I want to talk about Blades for a minute. And, of course, we have the whole show to talk because, really, this is a top-heavy card, no pun intended, with the heavyweights, right? And you realize it as you say it. And you're, wow, that was pretty good, if only it were on purpose. So when I look at what Blades has done, for a guy who's won four in a row in a heavyweight division that's loaded with killers, and we've talked about this, it's a division stacked, especially with Jones coming in, he hasn't really impressed Dana White all that much. The you know the the Shamil fight that was a good one, and that was back in uh, September of 2019. Had the TKO, then he TKOs JDS, and you think he's on that meteoric rise, one win away from a title shot. Then he comes out and he won against Alexander Volkov, but it was not a good fight. It was a boring fight in June of last year. I was there for that one, and um, it just was not a fight that impressed the boss. It didn't impress the powers that be to the point where. Dana even made a comment after the fight, if this kid wants a title shot, he's going to have to be a lot better than that. Yeah, I mean, you know, Dana, Dana, Dana wasn't happy with the fight, right? It, it wasn't aesthetically pleasing. But Blades did what he needed to do. He got the win, you, you know, and, and you can't take that away. And, and the more wins you get stacked up, whether they're impressive or not, you're going to be there. Uh, and so I, I take that with a grain of salt. You know, there's a lot of pressure. There's a, these are high-stakes fights right now. When we start getting into the top five of any division, and, and you kind of don't take risks sometimes. And, and I felt like that's what Blades did. He just made sure he got the win over Volkov. I, I, he probably, the pressure probably got to him, you know. Uh, we're at the top of the division now. You know, you're one or two fights away from a title fight. Uh, so I, I kind of take that with a great – we're going to find out on Saturday where Blades is whenever he takes on Ngannou that can, if he touches you, you are done. That, that's what makes this fight so intriguing to me. I think Blades is the better fighter. I mean, as far as skill set goes, I just think that Francis has, or uh, I'm sorry, Derek Lewis has what Francis has, you know, he, he has that one punch knockout power. You're never safe. You're never comfortable. If there's one second left in the fight, he can land a punch and end it. Almost did that against Volkov. It wasn't one second, but it was close. Volkov had that fight won and Lewis finished it late, the Black Beast. And of course, that was my balls is hot. Hey, why'd you take your shorts off, Derek? My balls is hot. That was that fight. But this is interesting, Jeff. They're both blue belts in jiu-jitsu, right? Speaking of Blades and Lewis, Lewis has that boxing and that one-punch knockout power. Actually got into combat sports thinking he was going to be a boxer. He's a boxer at heart and all those things. And then Blades, who's a national champion junior college wrestler, who went 19-2 and at Northern Illinois as a redshirt freshman before going to junior college, did not go on from junior college back to a four-year school, instead turning pro. He's at Elevation Fight Team. He's there with Gaethje. You know, he's there with Kamaru Usman, who just won his fight. And, you know, they got some killers in that gym, no doubt about it. But when I look at Derek Lewis versus Blades, Lewis is out of Houston. Blades is out of Colorado. Derek Lewis does have that one-punch power that can turn the lights out any time. But to his credit, you give the Black Beast a lot of credit because starting with Roy Nelson and others, he's fought high-level jiu-jitsu grapplers. He fought very high-level wrestlers and for the most part has held his own except for the Cormier fight when DC dominated him on the ground. But, I mean, who doesn't DC dominate on the ground for the most part? Yeah, I mean, that's that, that's, DC exposed the, the big weakness in Derek Lewis's game. Uh, but nobody else really has been able to. And that's a testament to how good Cormier is at, at his grappling, Olympic-level grappling, you know. Uh, so, so props to Lewis for, for even trying to, to go on the ground with him. But yeah, Blades, I feel like Blades is going to be able to get this fight to the ground. I don't know what he's going to be able to do there. I, I, I feel like uh, as this fight wears on, and, and I know that this is cliche because Lewis has shown that, that his cardio is, okay, is, is not you know, completely suspect, but I feel like he's going to fade in this fight because of the pressure that Blades is going to put on him. And Blades in his last few fights, while it, it, they were unimpressive, there were things in those fights. He, he, he's doing a really good job of feigning those takedowns to land that right hand. You know, he kind of he kind of gets you guessing on the takedown that opens up his striking. And we hadn't seen that earlier in his career, in my opinion. Um, and so I, I feel like the longer this fight goes, it's better off for Blades. Uh, but you're never out of trouble with, with Derek Lewis. I mean, that, that's the thing. You're just never out of trouble. You can never rest in there. Yeah, Lewis has had a lot more fights. You know, he's 24 and 7. And Blades, of course, doesn't have as many fights under his belt. And, you know, it's interesting. He's, he's 14 and 2. But Blades literally is one of those guys like a Cain Velasquez, Jeff, he came to the UFC after five fights. Literally, he's one of those guys, one of those top heavyweight prospects. Sometimes the division's a little thin and there aren't as many great fighters at that weight. But to get to the UFC so fast after only five fights, whereas Lewis fought in Bellator, he was a legacy champion, had a lot of local fights and regional fights. 
Blades is just one of those prodigies from day one, and people have seen gold written all over him from the time he first stepped into the cage. He's big, he's strong, he's fast, he does have incredible knockout power, and he's great on the ground. So he has all those things going for him, and like we said, the only two losses, one was a doctor stoppage, both of them TKOs against Francis Ngannou, and Francis has a long line of bodies in his wake, so certainly there, there's no shame in that game. Exactly. I mean, Francis Ngannou's the number one contender in the division for a reason. He He's fighting for the title for, for a reason. And and I, I'm glad you brought up that Blades got into the UFC uh, that early. I feel like in those fights, he felt like he was going to be able to have more success uh, with his takedowns and, and controlling Ngannou on the ground, and he just did not. You know, Francis is a different animal altogether. You know, uh, he, he his his attributes are are hard to overcome. And, and, and Blades has felt that twice, you, you know. I, I feel like that, you know, like I said, they've been in there with a, with a lot of the same people. And, and I think this fight comes down to who's able – well, it comes down to if Lewis is, is able to land that big shot. If Lewis is able to land that big shot, then, then you know, Blades is probably going to lose this fight. If Blades is able to do what he does, which I think he's going to be able to, uh, I think Blades is going to look good in this fight. I just don't know if he's going to get clipped. And, and so that, that, you know, that's, that's how I look at this fight. It all comes down. And I don't mean that Derrick Lewis only has a puncher's chance. That's not what I mean. What I mean is we're all going to be on the edge of our seats waiting to see if Derrick Lewis flattens him like, like he has so many people. Absolutely, man. And it's just an incredible job. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about this fight. That's Jeff Kane. I'm Jim Greasehopper. Call me Grease. It's MMA Weekly's UFC Fight Night Preview for Blades vs. Lewis Saturday in the Apex. We'll get to a couple of the other fights in just a minute. But first, I want to remind you that we're powered by, presented by, driven by all these things, given energy, inspired by CBD Emporium featuring Level Select CBD. Go to stayinthefightmma.com. That's stayinthefightmma.com. For CBD Emporium featuring Level Select CBD, you get 50% off both lines of products right now. CBD Emporium and Level Select. Level Select is the purest CBD on the market, the highest concentration, zero THC, organic, all those things. It's just an unbelievable product, both of them. And we are proud to be affiliated with and to be represented by such incredible brands. CBD is the new craze. Everybody's on it. The fighters love it. It's good for sleep. It's good for anxiety. It's good for living pain-free like I do every day, giving you energy because you're not being zapped by that anxiety and by the pain and all those things that can just take away that bandwidth and make your days seem shorter and you're always more tired. Not the case for me at 49 years old, doing shows every day, working out every day, boxing, lifting. I'm able to do all those things at the level I do them because of Level Select CBD and CBD Emporium. Level Select CBD, stay in the fight, 50% off with the code MMA50 at stayinthefightmma.com. And Jeff, we have a, a big card this weekend, and by big, I mean a ton of fights. Uh, and, you know, usually things have been dropping off, a couple here and there, one or two because of COVID, but I've got a couple of buddies on this card, and, you know, I'll get to that in a minute, but I'm, I'm excited to see the girls. Nobody's talking about the Bantamweight fight in the co-main. Everyone's just talking about the main event, with Blades and Lewis, and of course when the heavyweights with the knockout power get in there, that's what you're going to get, number two and number four. But how about Ketlin Vieira and Yana Kuniskaya right there at Bantamweight on the women's side? And that, that's the co-main event. I'm, I'm really excited to see that one because when you look at Yana's rank number seven in the world and, and Ketlin Vieira is not, she's number six. So you got number seven and number six. Yeah, this is a great co-main event, but it's kind of going under the radar because everybody's focused on that heavyweight fight uh, because it has so many implications. This fight also has implications. You know, th this is an interesting matchup uh, between a black belt in jiu-jitsu and a black belt in judo against uh, Yana, who's primarily a striker. So this is a conflicting style matchup. You, you know, this is, a, this is an extremely good matchup, and they've been in there with good people. You, you, you know, uh, Vieira is coming off that win over uh, Sierra Eubanks, who's ranked number 13. She uh, has a win over Sarah McMahon that's number eight. She's been in there with Kat Sangano. She's been in there with Ashley Evans Smith. She's been in there. She's coming off her last outing she won against, the, uh, against Eubanks, but the, the fight before that, she actually suffered her first career loss against the number four ranked Aldana. You know, she's been in there with high-level comp competition. So has Yana. You know, she's been in there with uh, Lena Landsberg. She's been in there with Marion Renew. She's been in there with Aspen Ladd. Cyborg. This, yeah, she's been in there with Cyborg. Tanya Evinger, I don't want to leave her off because uh, whenever she was on top of her game, she she was hard to deal with by a lot of people. Um, this is a very competitive fight, and it's and it's a conflicting style matchup. So it's going to be interesting to see how this how this plays out. But I agree, this fight's flying under the the radar. 
Yeah, and, and of course, Yana's been a, um, a champion in Invicta as a Bantamweight. She's been a Russian Taekwondo and Muay Thai champ. So matchups make fights, Jeff, and which fighter is able to impose her will more in this one is going to go a long way toward determining the victor because you are talking about an incredible world-class grappler and an incredible world-class striker. You get that matchup in this one, and it's exact, diametrically opposed, complete opposites. Of course, both girls can do it all. You don't make it to this level if you can't. But that, that classic striker versus grappler is going to be on full display here. Yeah, and it's got some good implications. You know, one of them is going to drop in the rankings. The other one's going to inch closer towards the top of it. Uh, th this is a good fight. It's going to be an exciting fight as well, I think. It it's going to play. It's got to play out like a chess match, right? I mean, you're going to see Vieira trying to get this fight to the ground. And Yana, if it goes there, trying to stay out of uh, the danger of a submission. And on the, you, you know, we'll see where uh, Vieira's striking matches up against, one, uh, you know, a really high-level striker. Yeah, and of course, we'll look at some of the odds before we wrap it up here today. And that's Jeff Kane. I'm Jim Greeshaber here on MMA Weekly. And some great matchups on this card, top to bottom. Vieira and, and Kunitskaya, we just talked about that a little bit, the co-main event. And, and I look at Yana's got some more big fight experience, but Vieira, I mean, she was just undefeated not that long ago. So I, I think it was Aldana, the only loss that she has, right in December of 2019. That seems like so long ago now, pre-COVID. But um, coming off the win over Ebanks, who's a tough competitor, both girls have, you know, impressive wins on their resumes. And, and Yana, as you mentioned, has fought everyone. And, you know, the Cyborg fight was something that, that didn't go her way. And that was a tough one, TKO first round. But, you know, she won two in a row after that. Aspen Ladd beat her. And now she's coming off another win. So, interesting for both girls. I mean, you're talking about a division that Amanda Nunes has just had a stranglehold on, right? And uh, you, you've got, on the women's side, Valentina and Amanda Two of the best who have ever done it, and Wei Li, the three, I mean, just incredible champions in all three weight classes. But when I look at the band weight division, because Amanda's defending the featherweight belt coming up against Megan Anderson, and, and that's a big one right around the corner, March 6th, UFC 259. And then you have on the band weight side, Jermaine Durand is still the number one competitor. Amanda just beat her. Holly Holm, Amanda's already beaten her pretty, you know, pretty easily. And then Aspen Ladd at number three. Aldana's at four. So, and Pena's at number five. So, the winner of this one is going to be looking at a top three opponent. Oh, 100%. 100%. And look, Yana, those fights, uh, you know, in Cyborg and Avenger, I, I believe that those were at Featherweight. You, you know, so she was taking fights out of her division. You know, now she's back at Bantamweight and, and, and going to try to make a run at the top of that division. This is this is a great fight. I mean, both the, both of these fighters are experienced. Both of them have been in there with with the highest of level of competition, um, and now they're going to go in there and see which one is rightfully a contender and which one still kind of stays in that second half of the top ten. Yeah, no doubt, man. And that's going to be exciting to see that co-main event before Blades and Lewis make the walk to the octagon and some big opportunities. You know, Charles Rosa and Derek Minner, Alexi Olenek and Chris Dacus, that's a big fight at heavyweight. Phil Hawes, a contender series winner, has a fight on the main card. And Andre Arlovsky, the eight, I don't want to call him the ageless wonder, but, you know, I mean, it just seems like so long ago that he was the UFC heavyweight champ. He's 42 years old. So anytime anyone, and I say this every time it happens, anytime anyone in, in his or her 40s steps in the octagon, we love him automatically because th that's our generation. Those are our guys right there. Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, Andre, uh, you know, he's a former champion. We've watched him. Uh, this is his 52nd fight, I believe. Yep, yep. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's, he's had a 22-year fighting career. You, you know, uh, the problem with this fight, looking at this fight to me, is Aspinall's 27 years old with knockout power. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, nine of his or eight of his nine wins are by knockout. You, you know, and so, and then his UFC debut, he took out Jake Collier in 45 seconds, you know. So I feel like this is going to be a fight where maybe youth prevails and, and, and maybe we're at the tail end of Andre Orlovsky's career, man. I mean, I would love to see the pit bull kind of pull out another one, you know. I would love to see that. But at the same time, that means he's going to get higher ranked opponents. I don't necessarily want to see that. Uh, but but I, I feel like Tom's going to win this fight. You know, I, I really do. I think that youth is going to he's going to land a big shot and Andre's going to go to sleep. Yeah, and he was a, a youth Sambo champion as a kid. He's been fighting forever at 42 years old, and he's fought everyone. I mean, you name them, he's fought them in the heavyweight division, and he, of course, in Bellator, in the UFC as a champ, then in Bellator, back in the UFC. He's won two in a row. I mean, this is, I mean, his last loss was to Rosenstreich by TKO, or knockout, actually, at UFC 244, November 2019. That was a 29-second fight. 
and he's been that become that guy. He's become the guy that you have to beat as a top young prospect to take that next step, to make it to that next level. Now they give him like a Rothwell fight here and there, and when you think about that, that's you know obviously two older guys. But for the most part, Arlovsky's become that guy who you have to beat to move up a level in the heavyweight division, and that's exactly what Tom's looking to do this week. Uh, exactly. Arlovsky has a great name, you know, but he has become a gatekeeper. I mean, that's that's what he's become. Uh, gatekeeper. There you go. Yeah, in the heavyweight division. But he has a great name and he has a great legacy and a great history. And so it's a good win to have on your resume, you know, and Aspinall is going to try to put that on his resume. Yeah. Andre's been in there with everybody. You know, I remember when he left the UFC to go to Affliction and fought Fedor and was taking it to Fedor. Mm-hmm. I mean, taking it to him, touching him up. And then he jumped in for that flying knee and Fedor landed that huge overhand right that just dropped. I mean, face planted him to the canvas uh andre orlovsky in his prime was the best heavyweight in the world you know and and or or the second best depends on how how you felt fedor and him did match up fedor did win that fight but at that time you know those were the two heavyweights that people were talking about who's the best heavyweight in the world andre orlovsky was in that conversation uh i like i said I, I would love to see Andre win, but I don't want to see Andre take fights against the top of the division. I, I think that those days for him are over, uh, or I hope they're over. Um, and, and plus, man, all the, just looking at this matchup, I, I feel like Tom's going to land a big shot on the aging veteran and, and kind of send him off um, with, with a loss. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, Arlovsky, you never know when he's, how long he's going to keep fighting for. Oster Overeem, we just saw him in his 40s fight against Volkov, and it didn't go his way. And so I'm interested to see, though. I mean, this is a great card for the heavyweights. We talked about that. Arlovsky and, and for Aspinall, a chance to, to make a name for himself against a former champion and, like you said, a gatekeeper. And then Alexi Olenek and Chris Dacus. When you look at that fight, man, Alexi Olenek is a guy who, look, I mean, I like him. I, I've always liked Olenek. He's a tough dude, a very tough fighter. And, you know, you've seen him just lost to Derek Lewis, TKO in the second round, at the very beginning of the second round. But he had just beaten Maurice Green and Fabricio Verdum back to back, and before that it was Walt Harris and Overeem who beat him. But and he's fought Hunt, Travis Brown, Curtis Blades. He's fought the best of the best, and he's hung around in those rankings. I think he's at number six right now. And for Dawkins, you know, a lot of people don't know a ton about him, but I mean, he's out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was he literally um, was was Pete Parker Porter on the early prelims on ESPN Plus a few months back. But you know, an, another opportunity for an up and coming guy to get a big win here. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, Alexi's actually ranked 10th, uh, but yeah, he was right there, but you know, it's re- you know, that, that heavyweight division shook has shaken up a little bit, but look, this guy, you talk about experience. We just talked about Andre Arlovsky's experience. This is Alexi's 75th fight. This is his 75th fight, you know? And so that is what uh, Dawkins has to overcome. The experience of a guy who's been in there with everybody. Now, Olenek is 43, right? I mean, you know, he's he, he's a, he's not a young guy, but he's st- he hasn't shown the wear. He hasn't shown that he's slowing down much. And so this, in my opinion, is going to be a very tough fight for Dawkins, man. Uh, although <laughs> he has knockout power, man. He's 2-0 and in the UFC, and nine of his 10 wins have come by knockout. I mean, you got to watch this kid but i feel like man that that 75 fight experience is going to come into play into this fight yeah no and i i actually was there when Dawkins fought in august and had that big win by knockout so interesting too when you think about it the opportunity to make a name for yourself on the big stage espn and then you got arlovsky on the card you got blades and lewis on the card and a lot of heavyweights so the eyes of the world will be on not only this fight card but especially the heavyweight division. So a great opportunity for Tom Aspinall and a great opportunity for Chris Dawkins against two well-known fighters. And then also on this card, you've got Pat Sabatini and Rafael Alves. You've got Jared Gordon and Danny Chavez. Dracar Close, Dre, I know him from Arizona, called a bunch of his fights on the way up at 55. And, you know, who could forget his his war uh, last year? It was in March, I believe, on the Izzy Yoel card. And that was against... Um, why am I drawing a uh, Benil Darius and Jakar Close actually had that fight won. Had Darius hurt, easy for me to say he had it won, but he had Darius hurt. Darius outlasted him, you know, standing toe to toe. So that was a war against the top ten guy who's on the rise. Jakar Close has always had the talent to pull it all together and make a run in the UFC. Eddie Wineland's on this card against John Castaneda. So many good fights and 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 really a ton of fights on this one. I think fifteen overall. Yeah, I don't remember a UFC fight card having 15 fights. You know this, and now you know we're we're still a couple of days away, and so uh, you you could have 
some people fall off at the weigh-ins or after the weigh-ins or whatever. But right now, we got a 15-fight card. And I cannot think of a, of a card in UFC history that's had more than 15 fights. That's up there. I'm not saying it's the record, but, I, but it's up there pushing the record if it's not. Um, yeah, there's a lot of good fighters on, this, on the undercard as well. But, you know, the, the main card is what everybody was focused on. And what you brought up earlier with Blades and Lewis, if that fight's not stellar, Let's say that that is a boring fight. Then all of a sudden, Olenek winning big, he has a chance to outshine the main event guys. <laughs> you know, and so that that's that's the opportunity he has. While he's ranked tenth and kind of lower in that division, it doesn't matter, man. If you can outshine the main event, uh, you, you're coming off you're coming off rising in the rankings and getting the, the 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 matchmaker's attention and getting more importantly, maybe Dana White's attention. Yeah, it's crazy too when you think about this. Um... The, a lot of the fights on this card were postponed and moved. So including the main event, Blades and Lewis, that was postponed due to COVID. And that was when Blades tested positive in November. You have the Vieira fight against Kuniskaya. That was, you know, Vieira had to pull out because of visa issues. And that one's rescheduled. The Sergey Spivak fight was COVID-19. That was canceled and pushed to this card. The Zahabi fight was moved. And then the Phil Hawes fight, all those fights had been rescheduled from other cards onto this one. So that's become the norm in the COVID era for the UFC, just kind of moving fights around and, and pushing them back or moving them forward based on COVID tests. Yeah, we, we've seen tons of fights. I kind of call them COVID casualties off these fight cards, man. Uh, and you don't know when they're coming. You don't know who they're going to hit. Uh, but the UFC's done a great job of rescheduling these. You know, and, and uh, so that's kind of why we have 15 fights. I mean, the UFC's having to, to get these fights in for, for the fighters' contracts and everything. And, and they've, they've been scheduled before, and they were pushed back. And, and you know how that sucks, you, you know, Jim, whenever you've done it. You put in the work, and, and, you, and, you, and, every, and then the fight gets called off. You're not making money, man, and, and, and you've expected that money. So props to the UFC for being able to put these fights back on. And props to the fighters, man, for, uh, you know, a, being able to recover and doing the necessary things, the the uh, the quarantining and the testing and all of that, uh, because that's why we have so many fights falling off to COVID is because of the testing. The UFC does, but they they do an extensive amount of testing, and so you're going to have these. And um, but props to them for putting them back on. But you're right, man. This card is kind of the rejuvenation card, you know, the 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 resurrection card of fights that got canceled or the earlier fight cards. Yeah, no doubt. And as I look at the odds, Jim Greeshaber, Jeff Kane, UFC Fight Night, Blades vs. Lewis preview on MMA Weekly, powered by CBD Emporium, featuring Level Select CBD. Get 50% off right now, CBD Emporium and Level Select CBD products with the code MMA50, just because you know us, just because we like you, just because we're here for you. 50% off MMA50 at Stay in the Fight. MMA.com for Level Select CBD from CBD Emporium, Level Select CBD. Stay in the fight. And, Jeff, the thing that really jumps out to me about this card, Jim Greasehopper, Call Me Grease, and Jeff Kane, by the way, the odds on the Blades-Lewis fight, the Black Beast is a huge underdog. He's plus 300. Plus 300, minus 400, a big favorite, Curtis Blades. Wow. Um, well, I'll tell you what. If I were a betting person, I would throw money on Lewis because he's never out of any fight and he can knock anybody out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, anybody in the entire world. Um. Yeah, that's kind of crazy to me. Now, I, I expected Blades to be the favorite. I think he's the better all-around fighter. I think he has more of a skill set. I think he has more ways to win than Lewis does. But the one thing Lewis has is the ultimate nullifier of everything. <laughs> you know, it levels every playing field. Yeah. And so uh, those odds are kind of high to me. That, I mean, yeah, I mean, if, if, I'm a, if I'm a gambling man, I'm throwing money on Lewis just because that's where the money can be made. I'm not saying that Lewis is going to win. But I'm saying that that's a live dog right there. That's a, that's a real live dog. But I did expect Blades to be the favorite. I just didn't think it was going to be that big of a favorite. You know, this is the number two and four guy in the world. You know, those odds shouldn't be that. No, and, and when you look at him, that's among the lowest lines. William Hill right there. But some of the books have him at minus 450, minus 460. Lewis, the lowest I see him at is uh, the highest is plus 375. So you can actually get bet online. 375, Derek Lewis, for every 100 you bet. So if you throw 200 down and you do the math right there, obviously that's a big score. Elsewhere on the fight card, and I always look at William Hill because that's the biggest sports book, but when you see some of the odds here, uh, Ketlin Vieira is also a huge favorite. She's minus 303, the highest I see there. And let's see, for, for Kunitskaya, plus 230. 
plus 231 is the best number you can get on her. So also heavy favorite in the co-main event for Caitlin Vieira. That surprises me as well, Jim. That, that surprises me as well. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think that Vieira is definitely has everything it takes to beat Yana, but I, I just feel like uh, Yana's in fights too. She's a dangerous striker. You know, it just takes, you know, a combination and, and you're in a lot of trouble with her. I, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised at those odds as well. Look, I think that the dogs, man, you know, this could be an underdog night. The, I, I, there's money to be made if the underdogs come through, but that, that goes to say with every event. But these odds for this particular event, for the, especially the top two, two fights, the, the co-main event and the main event, they, they seem a little off to me. Just a little, a little off. That's all I'm saying. Just a tiny bit. A tiny bit off. And you got, you know, it's interesting, too, as I look ahead to next week, Cyril Gons a favorite, a pretty big favorite over Rosenstreich, which is a bit surprising. But if you want some huge odds and you're looking ahead, UFC 259, Jan Blahovic, a big underdog against Izzy Adesanya, is like minus 250, 260. And um, Piotr Jan, not much of a favorite over Algernon Sterling, about minus 160 to plus 125. But you want some crazy odds, Jeff? It's almost to the point, it is to the point where you would be crazy just to even throw a bet down. On Amanda Nunes, she's minus 905, minus 1200, minus 1250, minus 1400 on one book. And you can get up to 867, plus 867 for Megan. That's double what Holly Holm was against Ronda. That's pretty crazy. That that's pretty. Look, I, I think that Amanda Nunes is gonna is gonna win that fight, right? But Megan, Andy, you, look, it, it's the fight game. It's the fight game. You know, it just takes one shot. It just takes one shot. It just takes that Randleman hook to to flatten Crocop and cry and pride and shock the world. You know, it just yeah. takes Matt Sarah landing a right hand against George St. Pierre to change everything. Holly that, Holm a head kick. <laughs> yeah, that's. Then look, I, I'm not saying that I I think. Uh, Megan is going, has a great chance in this fight. She she does not. Nobody does against Amanda Nunes, right? Uh, but yeah, man, how could you not throw some money down? You got an extra hundred bucks laying around. Why not throw it on that? You know, I mean, if you don't need it, that's all I'm saying. It, you know, a lot of people are struggling out there. If you don't need the hundred bucks and it's just laying around, I don't know, man. The, the, the main event and co-main event this weekend could be a good opportunity. And that, just out of principle, you don't want to pass up getting an 875 plus 875 on anybody. How about if you did a parlay, Yana and Derek Lewis? That would pay huge money if you were able to hit on that one. But, you know, and, and I think the heavyweight division, when you lay a lot of lumber on one fighter, and, and you know what I mean? I mean, that, that's something in the heavyweight division that's really tough to do because out of any division, and light heavyweight too, but especially the heavyweights, one punch knockout power, and we've seen it so many times, just one shot, end of the line. We saw it with, with Junior Dos Santos against Cain Velasquez. We've seen it multiple times. Look at Stipe against Verdum, that one left hook as he was backpedaling. You know, just big shot after big shot. Francis Ngannou, again, we talked about the line of dead bodies he has left in his wake. And Rosenstreich, uh, you just over and over again in this division. And Derek Lewis, when you think about what he's done, the Volkov knockout was crazy when he was able to finish him. You know, and, and uh, the Alexi Olenek in round two, he just finished him violently. You know, and he has gone the distance, and he has won decisions. You know, he's won a unanimous decision over Latifi, a split decision in the fight before that. You know, he violently finished JDS. He he or was finished by JDS, had his lights turned out. But the Volkov KO, you know, he beat Nganu by decision. But Tabura, you know, I mean, Travis Brown, I mean, you just look at all the TKOs he has. Derek Lewis in his career, Jeff, has 19 knockouts. And you're laying big money if you're betting against him, a guy who has 19 knockouts. Now, that being said, his opponent in Curtis Blades, people have said from the beginning, hey, this guy has champ written all over him. In the division with John Jones coming in, Stipe, the GOAT, the greatest heavyweight champ of all time with an asterisk because, you know, certain guys don't fight each other or didn't fight each other in their primes. He never beat prime Kane. We didn't see a lot of prime healthy Kane, unfortunately. But you can't hold that against Stipe. He's got the most defenses. He, he came out on top in the, in the Legacy Fights, the trilogy against DC. He's already beaten Nganu. If Stipe beats Nganu again, then obviously the Jones fight, you know, that, that's just literally just icing on the cake. For, but when you think about the rest of the division, out of all the other guys, Jeff, out of all the other guys who are at the top of that division, I give Blades the best chance. I think he's the best fighter out of all the rest. And I'm not counting Jones. I'm not counting Stipe or Francis in there right now. But out of all the rest, I believe Blades is a notch above all those other guys, with the possible exception of maybe Cyril gone. 
I, I agree. I agree. And we don't know about Gon. You know, I think Gon is 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 partially unproven, but man, what a good prospect. Big favorite over over Rosenstreich, isn't that? That's surprising. It it is surprising, but he does have a lot of hype behind him right now. He's he's in that weird part of his career where, where we all have high hopes for him, but now he's getting the fights where we get to see if we're right or wrong uh, about his abilities. Um with the, the, the main event, man, yeah, I think that Blades has champion written all over him. I think he poses the, the, a, a tough matchup for everyone in the division. I, I, I think that he's probably more well-rounded than Francis, you know, um, but Francis has that one nullifying thing about him. Uh, this fight, for, for Lewis to be that big of an underdog, because this fight's going to take place a lot in the clinch, in my opinion. He's not just going to be able to take Lewis down immediately, like sh- just shoot a double leg and take him down. I feel like they're going to clinch. It's going to be along the fence a little bit, and maybe he's going to get those double legs later on in a fight, uh, in the fight, but I don't think he's going to get those early on. And so Lewis has really good elbows in the clinch. He has really good elbows in the clinch. And so I, to those odds just seem crazy to me. Throw, throw some money down on Lewis. Throw some money down on Lewis. Well, no disrespect, Blades. I think that you're the better fighter, but how can you pass up those odds? How can you pass up those odds? And when you look at what Blades is able to do wrestling-wise, at the top of the heavyweight division, is he the best wrestler? Is he the best wrestler in there right now? Stipe is a pretty good wrestler. Jones isn't there yet. When I look at the rest, and, and the other thing to think about here is Derek Lewis is barely making weight. He's 265, 264 every time he fights. So it's never easy to take down a guy that size. Just ask DC trying to take down Stipe, who's actually lighter. But when you look at what Derek Lewis did against Daniel Cormier, Cormier came into that fight a little banged up, and he dominated Lewis on the ground. But that's an Olympic-level wrestler and a two-division champion. Derek Lewis has done really well with his takedown defense. But not only that, Jeff, he's good off his back. He's managed to survive in a lot of fights where he has been taken down. Uh, yeah, 100%. He's not an easy out when you get him on the ground. Uh, he's, he, he, he improves position. He, he waits and, and kind of explodes. You, you know, you know he, he'll, he'll shrimp, and then he'll just explode with the power that he has, and, and he's able to get out of bad positions with just power a lot of times. Uh, but, but we've seen him fend off submission attempts. He's not terrible on the ground, but that's, good. that's an advantage where Blades has a big advantage. I'm not, I'm not saying that he's going to be able to submit him or finish him on the ground, but he might be able to control him there. And to answer your question, do I think Blades is the best wrestler in the heavyweight division? Now that Cormier is gone, um, there's a strong argument for that. I think the other argument would be about Stipe, right? I mean, Stipe's yeah. wrestling is largely underrated, uh, especially his anti-wrestling. You, you know, he's hard to take down. And, and, and so I don't know that Blades has a lot of wrestling success against Stipe because Cormier didn't. You know, and if Cormier's not having a lot of wrestling success, I just don't see Blades having it. But Blades is faster and younger and has different attributes than Cormier does. Um, but yeah, I think he's. I think it's. It's a good. It's a good argument. I think that he's at least the number two wrestler in the heavyweight division. And he's so strong. I mean, Curtis Blades is just literally his strength is inhuman. Yeah, and and I don't think that Blades. You know what I like about Blades is is he doesn't. Uh, he's a smart fighter. He, he he. It's a you know he sees. The, 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 the means to an end and he doesn't get distracted. He just goes in there and stays focused on the, on the, on the plan at hand. And that's what I like about him. He doesn't get, he doesn't deviate. Even if the fans are booing, even if Dane is criticizing, it doesn't matter to him. He's out there to, to accomplish his goal and he doesn't deviate from that. That's what I like about blades a lot. Uh, I, I feel like he doesn't get rattled. And where, both, oh, go ahead, Jeff. Sorry. Yeah, but Lewis doesn't get rattled either. I mean, if, if there's, if like, he's about maybe the most laid back fighter on the UFC roster. Yeah, he is. And, you know, he's had a knack for looking bad, not looking good at all, like having opponents who didn't make him look good and, and look like he didn't even belong in there sometimes and come back and win those fights. You know, w- whether it's adjustments in between rounds, and that's something we got to give Derek Lewis credit for. There have been a number of fights where you thought the Roy Nelson fight comes to mind, obviously the Volkov fight where you're thinking, wow, he's getting schooled here, and he ends up winning the fight. So he does always look tired and exhausted toward the end of rounds, but he always seems to find that extra level, that extra gear for a guy that size. And you know with the punching power and the boxing background, everyone's looking to take him down, wrestle and grapple him. He's done really well. Everyone wants to pin him up against the cage. They want to they want to get him anywhere they can where he can't have that distance to connect with that right hand and put the lights out. And he's survived a whole bunch of fights and been victorious in a whole bunch of fights just like that. And the other thing that really stands out, these are athletic dudes, very athletic guys. Not only is Lewis a boxer, not only is Blades an elite wrestler, they were both elite football players. 
I mean elite football players in high school and had college scholarship offers for that sport. So you're talking about two very strong fighters, two incredible athletes, and two guys, especially Lewis, who have seen and done it all. Yeah, yeah. Lewis, what what, what stands out about Lewis to me is, is what you said also. He's faced a ton of adversity and come back from those adversity, from that adversity in fights to win those fights. But what stands out to me is his knockout power late in a fight. Because as, as long as a fight goes on, you, 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 your legs get tired. Uh, you, you just don't have the power that you do. Each, each minute that goes by, the power meter on the fighter kind of diminishes a little bit. Lewis is able to get those knockouts late in fights. And that's a scary thing because even if you wear him down or you think you've worn him down, he still has knockout power. So that's the thing that stands out to me. And there's not a lot of heavyweights that are that way. No, and, and when you think about it, he hasn't really fought deep into too many fights. He made it to the fourth round against Mark Hunt and against Shamil, and they both have fought Shamil. But um, Derek Lewis has been scheduled for five rounds a few times. Just Alexi Olenek back in, um, in August, I was there for that one where he finished him at 21 seconds in round two. The Volkov fight was a three-round fight, and Lewis finished that one at 449 of round three. I don't think this one sees the fourth round. I don't know about you, but I, I mean the strongest – I feel about anything in this fight with the over-under is if Blades is able to impose his will in wrestling in the early rounds of this fight, he's going to finish Derek Lewis round two or round three at the latest. If Derek Lewis is able to impose his will early on, that could be a first-round finish and anywhere after that, as you said. So one of these guys is getting finished, I think, in under three full rounds. I think that's the safest bet on the whole card. I, I agree. I agree with that. Look, if, if, if Blades doesn't eat a big shot, he's going to TKO Lewis on the ground. He's going to take him down and get in a, in a dominant position and rain down elbows. He's got great grounded bound, and, and he's got good finishing uh, instincts. That's how I see this fight playing out. I, I feel like Blades will eventually get Lewis on the ground. Lewis might be turtled up trying to get back to his feet like he does sometimes, and Blades is just going to start unloading. That's how I see this fight ending. But, <laughs> you know, you get hit by Lewis, man, or you eat one of them elbows in the clinch, that's it. The, all yep. the game plans are out the window. And so – I, to me, this fight's kind of an even fight. Well, yes, man, I feel like Blades is the better fighter. Blades should win this fight. But <laughs> Derek Lewis, you know, you, you can never count that guy out. That, that's, that's why we're going to be on the edge of our seats, Jim. That, that's why we're going to be. That's why everybody's tuning in for this. It's because Derek Lewis flattens people. He doesn't just, like, stagger you or hurt you a little bit. When he connects, the lights go out. Yeah, and Nganu has finished Blades twice, once Dr. Stoppage after the second round, and that was in Blades' UFC debut when he had only had five fights under his belt. And then the second one was a, f a few fights after that. In 45 seconds, he turned his lights out. So we've seen that happen before with Francis Nganu and Blades. And again, Francis, we talked about the line of bodies. And for Derek Lewis, when you think about the wrestler that Blades is, has, you know, that's the thing for me. Like, he, he's fought Mitrione, who's not a wrestler, Sean Jordan, who was a football player, Gonzaga, you know, Nelson's a pretty good wrestler. Roy Nelson, let's look at the fighters who Lewis has fought. But when you think about the wrestlers, he really, the one guy is DC. And DC finished him. That was a rear naked choke submission in round two at UFC 230 when DC stepped up and defended his belt against Black Beast Derek Lewis there. So he has not faced a wrestler the quality of Blades other than DC. Nowhere even close. So clearly we know what Blades is going to try to do. The one thing, though, that I think about with a guy like Blades, Jeff, when you're looking for a title shot, when you're looking to keep climbing, and when you're looking to make a statement, I wonder if sometimes it gets in guys' heads because he knows the path to victory. He knows take him down, keep him down on the ground, hug it out with him, keep top position, keep beating him up on the ground, and then eventually wear him down and get that TKO or just win by decision on the ground, which I don't think would happen here. It's just too long of a fight. But then you run the risk of having Dana White say, oh, that was another boring performance, just like the Volkov one. So you, you almost get it in your head, hey, I need to finish him on the feet. And if you decide to stand and strike with Derek Lewis, that could be instantly catastrophic. 100%. And I think that it's always in the back of your mind. That's why Dana White says it. You know, I mean, whether Dana not means it or not, what he's doing is signaling to the fighters that I expect a little more effort for a finish or, or whatever in a fight. Uh, and so, yes, it's always in the back of your mind. You know, that the fans are, you know, we, 
the fans are crazy at MMA. You know, we, we've got a thirst for blood. You know, I mean, you either do something vicious or we're like, you're washed up or you were a never was. And, you know, it gets crazy. Not not us, but the fan, you know, the landscape of the fans in MMA is, is pretty brutal. <laughs> it is brutal. And, and Dana's brutal, too. But think about this, Jeff. And here's what I'd be thinking about if I were Blades. Just getting a win here doesn't guarantee him anything because you got Stipe and Ngannou in the end of March. And, and fingers crossed, both guys make it to that fight. And then John Jones, it's already been said that John Jones gets the winner. You know, that's not a given, given Dana's history of negotiating money with Bones. But you got to think that, that for that fight, especially, you know, Ngannou or Stipe, Ngannou would have a ton of sizzle behind it. Stipe is goat versus goat. So either way, that's a big fight. But even with a win here, Curtis Blades is not guaranteed anything because next week you have Gone and Rosenstrike. Right, so an impressive win for either one of those guys could leapfrog Blades, even when Blades gets a win, or if he gets a win in this fight, then you have a potential rematch with the Jones Stipe or Ngannou fight. You have Ngannou coming down. Blades might have to win this one and then win another one to get that title shot, because you could see Blades win this one, and you could see him get the winner of of Rosenstreich and Cyril Gone, because he hasn't fought either one of those guys either. Yeah, what Blades needs is for Stipe to defend to beat Francis. Because if Francis has has the belt, then he, Blades isn't going to be able to overcome two losses. Right. You know, that's, it, 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 and so his best friend right now is Stipe, it's somebody that he hasn't fought. And, um, and you know, that, that's a title fight. It's not going to happen because John Jones is going to happen. You know, so, so, so Blades is going to have to take a fight after this fight. And, and I agree, he could, he could get the winner there. It's not going to be Francis, though. Good news for Blades, right? Yeah. He could, he's going to face a lot. He could face a ton of people, man, who are tough fights, but it's not going to be Francis Ngannou. Probably won't be Stipe either. Even if Ngannou beats Stipe, it probably won't be Stipe. I, I would guess it would be the winner of Rosenstrike and Gon because they haven't fought each other. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I just don't know if they would put Gon, if Gon, especially if Gon looks really good in his next fight, he's got a lot of hype behind him. And I don't know if you want those guys on a collision course unless it's unless it's for sure a number one contender fight you know because one of them's going to fall and both of them are really on that on that on that uh, you know they have a lot of hype P- people people expect big things out of both of both of those guys blades and and gone i agree though that's a good fight and the fans are going to want it and the ufc isn't going to shy away from putting that fight together to protect gone or blades but i just say if i were a matchmaker i might not let their uh, paths kind of cross until a little later on because there's other guys that you can put in there but that that's a good fight, man. But Blades, yeah, and, and you know, and to your mind, to your mindset, like it's easier to go into a fight, or it would be for me if I know I got a title fight. You know, if I win this fight, I got a title fight. Blades is entering this fight, and and that's not going to happen. He knows that's not going to happen, and so I think kind of to me, it takes a little motivation away. I'm like, damn it! Not only do I got to beat Derek Lewis, I got to beat somebody else before I get to a title fight, and that's the hope that there's not a rematch between Ngannou and Stipe, or not a rematch between the winner of that and John Jones. I mean, there's a lot of things that has to play out for Blades to get to a title fight, and he's going to have to have more another at least one more fight after this. Yeah, and you don't have if Derek Lewis hasn't fought Gon or Rosenstreich either, so. The winner of this one versus the winner of that one makes total sense no matter who they are with both fights. And obviously they're on the same timeline a week apart. You would have to get back in there with camps, injuries notwithstanding and things like that. So let me ask you this, man. This is where I, I love doing this with you, Jeff, because 18 plus years you've been on the computer keyboard making it happen for MMA Weekly. You've been all over the world covering the UFC. You've been around from almost the beginning of the Zufa era, just literally right after Dana and the Fertitas came in. Have you ever seen the heavyweight division more stacked at the top right now? Especially with, you think about Jones coming in, who's unranked at the moment, because coming he's already guaranteed the winner of Stipe and Francis. Stipe champion, and Ganu number one contender. You look at Stipe's title defenses, you look at the DC trilogy, you look at the, the wake of dead bodies, I love to say that, with Francis and his resume that he has stacked up. Blades, one of the hottest prospects in a long time, who's only got the two in Ganu losses. Rosenstreich, who just lays dudes out, one after the other. Derek Lewis, of course, still making it happen, fighting the elite of the elite. Volkov, who just looked like a world beater against Overeem. Then you have Overeem with over 50 fights. What an end, Cyril gone. Have you ever seen the heavyweight division so jacked than it is right now? No, not this deep in the UFC. No, not, not, not at all. Now, it was, the, you know, there was that time where you had the Tim Sylvia and Andre Arlovsky mm-hmm. and kind of Frank Mir kind of trilogy that kept playing you know playing yeah. out and those were exciting times you know don't get me wrong tim Sylvia got his arm snapped by freak beer and then arlovsky knocks out tim Sylvia. i mean it was just crazy you, you know um but there wasn't that depth there wasn't that depth in the division you know there was top three or four or five guys at the most 
You know, in fact, I think that the most stacked the heavyweight division has ever been outside of where the UFC is right now was when Strike Force held their heavyweight uh, Grand Prix with Cormier and Verdum and, and, you know, and all those people, Overeem. I mean, that, that was a stacked uh, a tournament, but it was just a tournament. And then after that, they were all signed by the UFC, the whole promotion. And so I have never seen the UFC this stacked. No, and, and I think back a few years ago when you had Kane and JDS and, you know, you had Big Nog and you still had Frank Mir and you had the end of Brock Lesnar, Overeem's coming in, you had Travis Brown, you had Verdum, you had a pretty stacked division then, but I think these guys are better. I think these guys top to bottom are better. I think Nganu is the scariest knockout artist I've ever seen in almost any division, probably any division that you've seen. Um, and you see guys like No Love, Cody Garbrandt has that power and certain guys in certain divisions, but... Without a doubt, you know, Francis Ngannou just scares you to death. You know, you got to be scared when you go to – you could actually end up with brain damage or die in the octagon as a result of fighting. He's that guy. Rosenstreich's that guy. Cyril Gaon looks like a killer right now. I mean, just Blades is elite in any era. I really love the heavyweight division. And and, Je- and Jones coming in, the go at light. And John Jones better be careful. He's coming into a murderer's row, and all of them are looking to take his damn head off. Because what looks better on a resume, Jones or Stipe are the two guys. If you if you can take one of their heads off in a fight, that's a career-making win right there. So John Jones is a marked man, but he's also coming in as the hunter. He's coming in and getting a title shot in fight number one. And I honestly think that the rest of these guys, if Jones wins, obviously, it's a different story. But if Jones loses his heavyweight debut they're probably not going to get a shot to fight him. All these guys who are lining up to fight John Jones, they're not going to get that opportunity. But Jones comes in and beats a Stipe or an Ngannou, then that whole line of fighters is just like, me, me, let me do it, let me do it, because everyone wants a piece of him coming in. But, but it is a literal lineup of absolute killers right now at heavyweight. Oh, yeah, there's, there's no, uh, you know, easy opponent in that top 10. There, there's just not, <laughs> you know, uh, every one of those guys on, on a given night can beat anybody. And, you know, the heavyweight division kind of shows that. Stipe's the greatest, the GOAT, but really how many times has he defended a belt? It's not, it's a different division than like every other division on the roster. It's so hard to keep the heavyweight belt. It's so hard to put together a win streak because everybody's got power. And now... It, that is more, uh, you know, relevant than any other time in the UFC heavyweight division. Everybody's a killer. I agree with exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, Gone, Overeem, Volkov, Lewis, Rosenstreich, and Ganu, Stipe, those are all strikers. And Curtis Blades, the wrestler, has 10 knockouts. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it is unbelievable. Yeah, this is a great time in the heavyweight division. This is this is the best time in the heavyweight division. And whenever you brought up, you know, Bri- or Kane and JDS, the reason why they fought each other so many times is because the heavyweight division wasn't all that deep. Right. And then Brock, Brock come in there, and, you know, the heavyweight division got a lot, of, a lot of attention, but it wasn't all that deep still. And then now it's built up. Now we've got uh, – if you lose a fight, you can drop. You can drop like a rock. Yeah, and, and when we talked about the, the greatest wrestlers in heavyweight division history, I don't know how my dumbass forgot Brock. I mean, obviously, he's at the top of that list, you know, him and Kane and um, and then Blades. But him and Kane are, I think, the two top guys when you think about the heavyweights. Kane was a, a national runner-up in NCAA Division One at Arizona State, and Brock, of course, was a national champion. And so you think about those wrestling um, accolades. But, man, I, I Jeff, I can't wait. I, I think Blades is going to win the fight. I think he's going to be able to take him down and beat him up, and I think he's actually going to do it pretty convincingly and make a statement that he's aiming for that belt. I think it's his time. I think I think that, that win over Volkov, look, when you have a bad performance, quote-unquote, in a win, you still got the win, and now that performance looks that much better given what Volkov just did against Reem. So when you learn your lessons and you take those lumps in a win as opposed to a loss, I don't think that sat well with him. I think he's been pissed off this whole time. I think he's been dying and just, like, couldn't wait to get in here and show the world what he's really made of. I think he's going to finish Derek Lewis by the end of round one. I'd love to see Derek Lewis turn Blades' lights out. I love Derek Lewis. I think he's great for the sport. But I think this is a big statement win for Razor Blades. What do you think? I, I agree. I mean, I'm, I'm picking Blades to win this fight. I, I expect him to take Lewis down and pound him out on the ground. 
that that's how I feel. Or, or maybe it may be a submission, you know, but it's going to be taking him down and pounding on him until one of those two things happen. Uh, but Lewis is so dangerous. I don't like the odds. I'll say that. If I'm a betting man, I'm throwing money on Lewis, but I think Blades is going to win this fight. I agree with you. What's what works well for Blades as far as that last outing is our memories are short, right? Everybody has ADHD and, and or short-term memory loss in MMA. You're, you're as good as your last fight. We aren't going to remember how bad of an egg you laid, to, you know, six, four, five, six months ago if you put in a good performance on Saturday. And so that's what he's got going for him. We only remember your last outing. And so that's what he has going for him. And, and I agree with you. I think he's looking to make a statement in this fight. I think he's looking to finish Derek Lewis, do it early, and do it in impressive, in dramatic fashion. Yeah, and I also I also think that um, Ketlin Vera is looking to make a statement too, and maybe get a next title shot against Amanda at 35. So in this fight against Yana Kuniskaya, I actually I'm going Vieira. I mean, she's a beast. Obviously, we talked about the contrasting styles, the judo, the jiu-jitsu, and I think that she's just on that mission. And the loss against Irene Aldana didn't sit well with her, but that's the one thing that she's had that one roadblock. This is a huge fight for her. I'm going with Vieira in this fight. Man, I'm gonna. I can't believe I'm agreeing. I'm agreeing with you too much. Man, I, I'm going with her as well. I, I just think uh, what she's good at, she's better at than what Yana is good at. If that makes sense, I think she's going to be able to deal with Yana's striking. I think she's going to be able to get inside and 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 do what she wants to do in this fight, um, because Yana does not have one punch knockout power. I I I don't think. And so you might take a shot closing that distance, but you're going to close the distance. I, I I agree with you on this. I think that the two favorites are going to win the main event and the co-main event. All right, anybody else on this card before we wrap it up, Jeff, who you think is going to really impress and take a big step forward? We always love to do this toward the end of the show. You got Alexi Olenek, and, and Dawkins has a golden opportunity there. Aspinall has a great one against Arlovsky with a chance to finish him and, and move on up and make more of a name for himself. And then you got, you know, some other fighters like Phil Hawes at middleweight, been very impressive so far, a contender series guy. Jakar Close at lightweight, Jared Gordon at featherweight. Anybody else stand out to you as someone who uh, is going to make a statement and jump up in the rankings this week? Well, I'm, I'm definitely interested in the Phil Hawes and Amavov fight because they're both on win streaks. You know, one of their streaks has to, has to end here. Uh, that is an extremely a good fight to me. And then I think Charles Rosa has a lot. To, you know, his losses are to, to some really good – competition in, in Bryce Mitchell and in, in Yair. I mean, he took Yair to a split decision. And so I think he yep. has a good opportunity on this main card to look really good on a, on a, you know, on an event that people are interested in because of the heavyweight bout. So I think Rosa has, has a great opportunity here. And I think Phil Halls also has a great opportunity here. All right, there you have it. Jeff Kane, any last thoughts before we wrap it up? No, nah, man, I hope I hope it is a 15-fight card, Jim. We're going to have to start early. I, I, you know, I'm just not used to that many fights in the UFC. Other promotions, that, that's kind of normal, but not in the UFC. And so these prelims are going to start way earlier than normal. I'm looking forward to that, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to the heavyweight bout. I'm looking forward to the women's fight. Uh, and, yeah, man, this is the third event at the UFC Apex uh, out of an eight-event run. I'm, I'm looking forward to it, man. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited, and that's rare for me to be this excited before weigh-ins have taken place. Yeah, without a doubt, and it's it's set for 8 Eastern, which is um, – in, in that's earlier than normal. So 8 Eastern, which will be 5 Pacific, will be streaming live right here on MMA Weekly during the fights, giving you our analysis, our breakdowns. Sunday, we have UFC Fallout. We do that every week, and we're loving that show, and that'll be at 3 Eastern, noon Pacific on Sunday. Right now, I want to make an announcement and let you guys know that I got an exclusive interview coming your way that just did this morning with the legendary Patricio Pitbull, the lightweight and featherweight champion in Bellator, and his coach, Captain Eric Albatacin, who also coaches Henry Cejudo, who also coaches Paulo Costa, who also coaches Patricky Pitbull. So that interview is going to be dropped right here on MMA Weekly, so make sure you keep checking our YouTube, our Facebook, our Instagram, all new content coming your way. Smash that like button, hit the bell so you know when new episodes of our shows drop. We just got them started this year. We're taking Taking over the game, live coverage from UFC Fight Night, Lewis versus Blades, the press conference after. Going to be an epic night for us here on Saturday as well as Sunday with UFC Fallout. And as usual, all of it is powered by CBD Emporium featuring Level Select CBD. Stay in the fight, MMA.com. Stay in the fight, MMA.com. Right there, you get 50% off Level Select and CBD Emporium products by entering the code MMA50. Again, code MMA50 at stayinthefightmma.com for Level Select CBD from CBD Emporium. Level Select CBD, stay in 
the fight. For Jeff Kane and all the rest of us at MMA Weekly, don't forget the website either. All kinds of great coverage leading up to this fight and all around it. I'm Jim Greasehauer. Call me Grease. Thanks for being here for our UFC preview show, Fight Night Blades vs. Lewis. Jeff and I both think Curtis Blades is going to win that fight in the main event by taking Darius Lewis, Derek Lewis down and pounding him out on the ground. We will see you Saturday night for our UFC coverage live stream of Blades vs. Lewis. Until then, guys, keep your game tight and your mind right. Thank you for being with us. Make it a great day. Thank you.